dat u met ons meekijkt. Ik ben Serafine de Smit van Talisman. En op uh, de video ziet u ook mijn collega in Australië, Nicola Billens. En Nicola die uh, werkt voor uh, Alchemy. Dat is onze lokale partner in Australië. Daar hebben we een hele goede en fijne samenwerking mee. En uh, Nicola die gaat ons graag uh, meenemen op reis. Nou ja, een virtuele reis uh, door deze prachtige bestemming Australië. Uh, u kunt in de tussentijd ook uw uh, vragen stellen via de Q&A button. Die vindt u uh, onderaan het scherm. Um, en die behandel ik graag met u aan het einde van deze webinar. En dan geef ik nu het woord aan mijn collega Nicola. Welkom Nicola. Hi. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, and thank you very much for that welcome. I don't know what you said. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I'm Nicola um, from Alchemy. Um, partners with uh, Talisman on the ground here in Australia. Um, so I've been with Alchemy for about four years. I've, um, I've been working in luxury travel for 11 years and I have traveled all over the globe um, to all seven continents. And so the stuff I'm going to talk to you about today with Australia, um, when I talk about it with passion and love and excitement for my country, it's because I have traveled the world, I've seen a lot of stuff and I know that what we have here in Australia um, is going to impress you when you come here. It's, it's, um, it's world class and um, really amazing as well. So today what I'm going to take you through is um, a little bit of a sample itinerary, um, primarily for a first timer to Australia, but not necessarily. Um, and show you some of the highlights that typically someone would like to, um, to visit. Um, so I'll be covering Sydney, Uluru, um, the top end, which is where Darwin is, I'll talk about that. Um, tropical far north Queensland, you may have heard of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, some new experiences at the end. Um, and yeah, if you've got any questions, please just put them in the notes and I'll try and answer them for you at the end. Um, so the ideal time to come with this itinerary is generally between about April and May all, th all the way through to about September, October. Um, and duration wise, we would say 14 to 21 days. You know, if you want to stay longer, we can certainly help you out there. Um, the reason um, we say the ideal time to come is April, May through to September, October is because Australia is such a large continent or country that we have um, quite dramatic uh, different seasons. And the top end, if you can see where my mouse is um, going, this is what we call sort of the top half of Australia, that has quite extreme um, weather and we have a wet season and a dry season. Um, so we don't really want you um, going to that top area in the, in the wet season. It's kind of like a, a monsoon or tropical area and some parts of it uh, get flooded and aren't ideal for you to visit. So um, yeah, April to May through to September, October. Um, so we're going to start in Sydney. Um, so all of you will have heard of Sydney and the iconic Harbour Bridge, um, the Opera House. It's a very, very beautiful Sydney uh, city. Um, I've been living in Sid Sydney for, I lived there for about 13 years. I've now moved from there. Um, every day I would catch the ferry into work and I would see the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House every single day and I absolutely never got sick of it. It is absolutely a beautiful city. Um, what I wanted to show you though was just how much water and, and, and national park, forest, bush that we have in Sydney. So you can see this, uh, this top picture here, that really is um, a view of the, the city and then where most of us live. Um, but what you've got also, if you see on the right hand side here, this, this map here, you'll see um, where Sydney's located and then just all the, all the green, all the national parks that are surrounding it and then all the coastline. So because of that, it makes it a really good destination just in itself. A lot of people think that they need to um, come to Sydney, see the city and then get out of there. But actually, if you wanted to spend a lot more time just near Sydney, you more than, you know, you, you could spend a week or two just in the surrounding areas, um, sort of three hours north and three hours south. You'll see, you see these pictures down in the bottom, just what it looks like, you know, one hour south or 40 minutes north of, of the city. It really is just, you know, beautiful beaches um, and lots of national park. Um, 
Speaking of beaches, so Sydney's actually got about 100 beaches, give or take, when you look at all the, um, the harbour beaches and then all along that coastline. Um, you would have heard of Bondi Beach, this, this one here down on the um, bottom left-hand corner. Um, typically, that's where a lot of tourists go, a lot of backpackers. Um, it gets very, very busy um, with locals and tourists alone. Um, and same, this is Manly Beach here, another beautiful long beach. Um, this is to the north of the city and again, a, a very iconic um, kind of surf beach um, tourist destination. But what you also have is all these beautiful little coves and tiny beaches that are dotted all around um, the harbour, which is sort of where we think that you should probably um, go. So take a nice luxury um, yacht, go on more up, have some prawns and some oysters, go for a little swim and just really enjoy one of Sydney's lesser known beaches. Um, you Obviously I spoke about the Opera House and the Harbour Bridge. So really depending on your interests, we can tailor an experience at the, at the Opera House or the Harbour Bridge based on what, you, what you're interested in. So if you're interested in architecture, we can take you on a behind the scenes architectural version of a tour. Um, if you're interested in how a performance actually works, there's some really great um, behind the scenes tours that we've got where you can go and meet some of the actors. You could even have a walk on role on, on the stage in an opera at the Opera House. Um, so you'd arrive a couple of days early, you'd go and do a dress rehearsal, you'd get your costume fitted up and then on the night you could, um, you'd turn up at about six o'clock usually, um, about two hours before the performance. Um, you'd go into hair and makeup, you'd get your costume on and, and then you'd have this walk on roll. You're not necessarily singing, you're just sort of in, in, the, um, in the crowd scenes. Um, your partner would be watching you perform um, sitting at the opera house and then after the, second, after the first half of the opera was done, you could go and quickly take off all your makeup and then uh, join your partner to watch the rest of the opera and relax because you'd probably be pretty excited. Um, in terms of the, the Harbour Bridge, um, we, can, we can do all sorts of things with the Harbour Bridge. If you've got a really big budget, we can shut down the whole of the top of the bridge and you could have a private dining experience up the top. Um, I've done karaoke up there, there's sunrise yoga. We can organise a, a Mad Hatter's tea party, a kids party up there. So, you know, we can get really creative um, and yeah, whatever your passion is, we can, um, we can do it. So some really cool um, experiences just with those two um, the icons of Australia. Um, there's a new, uh, new hotel I wanted to point out. Um, Taronga Zoo is, uh, Australia is pretty much iconic zoo. It's um, in the most incredible location right on Sydney Harbour. Um, so you can walk through and see the animals and you've got the bridge and the opera house in the background. And now there's this new um, luxury hotel there that you can stay at. So you can have koalas right in front of you, some little tiny kangaroos hopping around and you can wake up to um, being one of the most beautiful places in, in the world really. Um, so that's only been open probably uh, almost a year now, although I suppose with, with COVID it's been closed. Um, I mentioned sort of the, the bush and the, the um, national parks that are surrounding Sydney. So you can see these are some examples of um, the kind of um, wilderness and scenery that, that is so close to Sydney. So these waterfalls here are within about an, a 90 minute drive of Sydney. Um, so there's two kind of areas that you may have heard of. One is the Blue Mountains and one is the Southern Highlands. So you've got scenery like this, you've got amazing, um, amazing bushwalks, you've got the waterfalls, you can do all sorts of other activities. I've done a, a bush survival course there, but you could go um, kayaking or canyoning, um, canoeing. So lots of nature-based activities, very um, accessible from Sydney. And then you could, you know, you could kind of go to the Sahara. <laughs> so this is about um, a three hour drive from Sydney. But again, I just wanted to show you that you don't actually need to go very far to have some really exciting experiences. And especially at this time uh, with COVID and people not necessarily wanting to hop in planes all the time, um, this might be a nice option for you if we can create um, an itinerary quite close to Sydney without having to hop in planes. Um, there's also some beautiful um, fine dining restaurants 
all accessible by seaplane. So you could do this as a day trip from Sydney. Um, so you're, you basically take off from the harbour in the seaplane. Um, you have a beautiful scenic flight all the way up the northern coastline and then you'll land on essentially what is another Sydney harbour, um, just, just a little bit further north. Um, so there's some great options there. There's also a, a new accommodation place here called the Lily Pad. So this is probably for more of your Instagrammable um, generation. So um, you rock up in the in the seaplane and then you've got this kind of uh, houseboat style accommodation that you can stay at for the night. I live up in this area, so I'm a big fan. I think it's one of the most, the biggest hidden secrets that we've got in Australia. Um, you've also got a pearling experience. So um, again, this is about a, one hour, 90 minute drive, depending on, on um, where we, we have the tour going from, or you could take a seaplane and you can learn about pearl farms. So the reason pearls grow in this, um, this area is because the water is just so pristine. Um, pearls don't grow if, if, uh, if the water's no good. So you can come along, you can learn how they farm and, and you know, really take care and nurture these pearls for, probably up to three years. And then um, they'll shuck some pearls, for, shuck, some, shuck the pearl oysters for you and you, you'll you see a pearl just popping out straight away. Um, if you've, uh, you know, want to do something special, we can, um, we can organize a pearl fashion tour for you on a, a deserted beach. There's all sorts of um, ways that we can craft this into a really um, bespoke experience for you. Um, so after Sydney, we're going we're gonna to hop over to Uluru. Um, you would have all seen uh, this um, icon of Australia. It's really, we, we say, it's, we say it's, the, it's sort of geographic heart, but really it's also the cultural heart of Australia. So it's about a three hour, 20 minute flight from Sydney. Um, and really you're going there because it's, um, well, number one, just being in the presence of Uluru is there's something quite mesmerizing about it. You can see why the indigenous people found it so sacred, but it's a really good opportunity to um, learn about our indigenous culture that is there. Um, we say allowed two to four days. Um, it really depends on sort of how much you, you want to sort of learn about the indigenous culture and how much you want to see. There's a lot to do and see. Um, the premium accommodation there is Longitude 131. You may have heard of it. It's a luxury lodge of Australia. Um, and it's got about 10 of these kind of white domed luxury tents. Um, really, really good service. It's, it's pretty much one of the most iconic um, accommodations in Australia. Can be a little bit hard to get into. So really, if, you, if you've got your heart set on it, I would always advise um, making sure you book well ahead of time. But you stay in these luxury safari tents. Um, all of them have got a view of, of Uluru. So it's the only, it's pretty much the only accommodation that does have um, a view of Uluru. There's one, one other hotel that might have a view from, from one little room, but pretty much this is, this is it. It's out on its own. Um, and yeah, you've just got these beautiful, beautiful um, spaces just to spend some time in. Um, things to do around there. So as I said, indigenous um, culture is very, very strong there. Um, so you can learn all sorts of, uh, all sorts of, um, or you can do all sorts of activities, whether it be learning about bush food, learning about the culture, um, the art. So people who like collecting indigenous art, we can organize for, um, for you to go out and actually spend some time in the communities where the artists are actually producing the art. Um, you'll see these, these these rock formations here. This is called Katatuja. Um, I can never say it properly. Um, it used to be called the Olgas. And again, it, it, they're sort of in view um, of Uluru. They're quite close to Uluru. So you can do both of these, um, these rock formations um, while you're there. Very iconic. You can go for walks through them as well. Um, you can cycle or walk around Uluru. I think they've got segways if, if you are that way inclined. I prefer a bit more of a, a natural experience. Um, the stars out there are amazing because you've got hardly any light pollution. We can arrange opera in the outback. So there's all sorts of, um, all sorts of things we can do for you, just depending on um, what, you're, what you're passionate about. Um, in terms of in the indigenous culture, um, some, of the, some of the guides that we use, they're so, um, 
I guess they've held on to their culture for so long that sometimes English is not their first language. It may be their second, third or fourth language. Um, sometimes you, we, you may have trouble understanding them. So sometimes we might, um, if your English isn't particularly good, and I hope I'm not um, talking too fast, then we might get you an interpreter as well um, to come along for the trip with you. Um, this is Mount Connor. So this is actually not Uluru. It looks quite similar. Um, but if you're wanting a bit of an um, extra wow factor to your holiday, we can um, organise to land a helicopter on the top and um, put out a beautiful table with um, fine dining and um, have a beautiful celebration lunch on top, of, um, on top of Mount Connor. So we would normally incorporate this if you're getting from A to B, perhaps going to Kings Canyon, which is another of the highlights in this region, um, or perhaps if you're going down to do an art experience in a community with, um, with one of the indigenous communities. So just, just showcasing something else in that region. Um, if you like animals and wildlife, um, or you're going with your family, perhaps um, you'd like to meet Kangaroo Dundee. So he is, um, he's just a man, he's just an ordinary man who started rescuing kangaroos. Um, so what happens unfortunately is on the roads, sometimes the kangaroos hop on to the roads and they get hit by cars. So um, the way the kangaroo works, it has a little, little pouch and often they've got their little baby Joey inside and often the, the mother would get killed but the baby would still be alive inside the pouch. So um, kangaroo Dundee, he goes by the nickname Brolga, which is a, an Australian bird. He would go through and rescue the joeys and then just rear them up himself. So he's been doing it a very long time now. I, I can't remember that it's 10 or 20 years, but you can um, organise a private um, experience with him and you can go and hand feed some of the kangaroos, which is a pretty special experience. Okay, so now we're gonna fly up to the top end. So this is going up to that region I talked about that was kind of monsoonal. Um, and you can see this big crocodile up here. So what happens when the rains come is the area gets so flooded that the crocodiles can kind of go anywhere they want into any of the river systems. Um, and so that sort of, that's really happening around about Christmas time, I guess, sort of January, December to kind of January, and um, and then as the as the rains and recede and the floodwaters recede, crocodiles sometimes get stuck in a different area to where they started. So before a lot of the tourism um, kind of starts up again, you have um, rangers that go and check water holes to make sure that there are no crocodiles. Um, so that it's safe for you to swim in them um, <laughs> when you when you turn up. Um, they're fasc fascinating animals. I don't know if you've ever seen them before, but um, when you go out on a safari looking for them, it's it's a little bit scary when they start coming towards you. Um, so yeah, the top end. So going up from Uluru, it's about a, a two almost two and a half hour flight. Um, as I said, it's got the wet and the dry seasons. Um, but what's so great about this region and also fabulous, you know, post COVID is that it's only got a very, very, very small population. So um, if you look at per square kilometre, um, the top end has 0.16 people per square kilometre. And you compare that with say Paris with, you know, 21 and a half thousand people. So if you're looking for somewhere that has no people, um, feels a bit like Africa because it really does feel a little bit like Africa um, and also has a very strong indigenous um, culture there as well, then the top end is amazing. And it really is, um, again, one of those sort of, it, ha it hasn't really been on the radar for a lot of international tourists. It did get a little bit famous when Crocodile Dundee um, came out, a, a movie about 20 years ago. Um, but it's one of my favourite places um, and I'll hopefully show you why in this presentation. Um, so this is Bamaroo Plains. Uh, this is one of the luxury lodges of Australia and it is uh, one of my favourite, uh, uh, very much one of my favourite places in Australia, if not the world. Um, so it is, I mentioned about the, the flooding. So it's on a, a floodplain. Um, this shuts down. Uh, 
almost six months of the year because of all that water and all that wet season and the crocodiles and um, just being too hot. Um, the roads are flooded. So it's just, you know, it's not an easy, easy place to keep open. But when the water recedes, you, um, you get, uh, it, it opens up again and uh, you've got these airboats that you can go out on and, and do safaris on. And you've got uh, about 10 of these safari bungalows. So they're all individual and they're mesh on three sides. And you can kind of see it from these pictures. Um, but when you're lying in bed, you, you just, you feel like you are just immersed in nature. So you feel like you're a part of your environment. And it's amazing. I've taken, um, I've taken travel agents there before and they've just said that's one of the best places that they've ever stayed. So it's, a, um, it's actually, a, it's, a, it's located on a, a massive buffalo pastoral station. So there's about, I think it's about 100 square kilometres large. Um, you're the only tourist there, so only up to 20 tourists there. And so you can be lying in your bed and seeing the buffalo go past. There's thousands and thousands of birds they'll wake you up in the morning but you're okay with that um, you'll see wallabies and kangaroos um, all sorts of different animals um, very 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 special place in Australia um, so you do activities um, like going out on these airboats to look for crocodiles um, to look at the birds the guides there are probably some of the best that we have in Australia um, very much it's very much a kind of African kind of experience except you're you're not in Africa and you're not going to get killed by a lion I suppose <laughs> um, very beautiful gorgeous sunsets um, yeah just a just a really nice place to to go it's likened to the Okavango Delta if, if you've been there before um, just before it opens up to um, to luxury guests it actually turns into a fishing lodge so this is when when the water is still receding so, um, it's called the we call it the runoff and um, instead of going out on safari on the airboats, you can go out fishing. So it's not for everyone. I don't like fishing. I couldn't imagine anything worse. Um, but um, for men who like fishing, you can just go and spend eight hours all day fishing. It's catch and release. Um, and then you can go back and sleep in one of those amazing safari tents. Um, from there, from Bamaroo Plains, you can do a day trip into the nearby um, Arnhem Land and Kakadu National Park. So Kakadu National Park was made famous in Crocodile Dundee. It's one of our iconic um, national parks. And it's, it's, it's got very um, beautiful scenery and wonderful water holes. I think I've got a picture here. Yeah, so it's got these beautiful swim holes. And I mentioned earlier about the crocodiles. So at some times of the year, not all of the um, water holes are safe for swimming. Um, but once the, the national parks rangers have been through and checked and made sure, made sure there's no crocodiles, they're perfectly safe and they are absolutely beautiful. Um, sometimes you'll swim at the top of a waterfall. Sometimes you can swim at the bottom of the waterfall. Um, and it's just, it's, it's really nice. <laughs> um, I really love it. I've been a couple of times and um, I'd actually booked to go back um, in August, but unfortunately because of COVID, I couldn't go. So not that I had COVID, but I wasn't able to go. They canceled all the flights. Um, so that's Kakadu. And then also you've got Arnhem Land. Now, so Arnhem Land is, it's kind of, I guess the best way to explain it would be an Aboriginal res res reservation area. So um, it's off limits to normal Australians. Um, we need permits to go in there and you really need an Aboriginal guide to kind of take you in. Um, so you can, we can, we can organise, we've got guides who basically lived and grew up in the area. Um, so they, they can take you in and show you some of the most incredible um, Aboriginal rock art you'll ever see. Um, this, is, this is a guy called Ronald. So I went in there and he showed us around and you've just got layers upon layers upon layers of this indigenous artwork. And they can you know, talk you through what some of it means and really interpret um, the rock art for you. Um, you can see here some of the scenery. I mean, it's just amazing. And then they also have indigenous art communities there, you know, people painting. So you can go and meet some of the artists um, and perhaps purchase some of their work if, if you're interested. So Arnhem Land's a very special place. Um, 
at the moment due to COVID, they've basically shut everybody out because um, the Indigenous people suffer from quite a lot of health problems as it is, so they don't want to let um, any, any COVID get in. Um, and then one of my, I've got so many favourite experiences, but um, this is one of my other ones. Um, this is basically if you're short on time and you'd like to do something really exciting, um, it goes out of Darwin Airport, which is the major city up in that area, and you take a float plane straight from the airport and then you land on this lagoon, um, which you can see there just looks like something that you would find, whether it, you know, Borneo or Africa or um, somewhere in South America. And it just feels so beautiful and you can hear the birds chirping and really lovely. So you land on, um, on that sort of river lagoon and then you pull up, there's a pontoon permanently stationed there. You'll, um, you'll pull up on the float plane, hop off, and they'll have a cooked breakfast for you or a cooked lunch, depending on what, what you wanted, what time of day. And then they take you out on an airboat um, below, you can see below here on the right, and you'll go looking for crocodiles. So you'll meander through all those little tributaries coming off this lagoon, um, go looking for crocodiles, learn a little bit about the, the region and the nature um, and the wildlife, come back, and then there'll be a helicopter waiting for you. So then you go up in the helicopter, Again, having a different kind of perspective than you got from in the plane. Um, you go looking for wildlife. So when I did it, um, I'd see kangaroos hopping. It was really cool. Um, and then we popped down and, and saw, saw these termite uh, mounds. And you go back to the pontoon and then you can take off from the, um, in, the, in the float plane again and go back to Darwin. And you're done in like four hours. And it's really amazing. Um, and so if you've got short on time and just want a really wow kind of experience. This, this is uh, one of the better ones for you. Um, another day trip from Darwin, um, again, very much an indigenous experience. You can get there um, either a float plane, helicopter, another big, normal fixed wing um, or a ferry. Um, and so the Tiwi Islands, they're probably, I guess, a, a two hour boat ride from, from Darwin. Um, and Again, very, very strong in the Indigenous culture. So very few kind of Australians would have travelled there. Um, so, and they've got a different style of art. So they do ceramics and kind of different style um, sculptures, if you want. So, yeah, you can go there and we can um, match up with an artist and you can have a wonderful experience there as well, learning about <coughs> a slightly different version of Indigenous culture. So that's the top end. That's just a very, very brief introduction to the top end. Um, yeah, it is, is absolutely amazing. So now we're going to fly over to uh, far north Queensland. So again, um, I'll just flip through. Yeah, so Queen, So we're, where this dot is here, we're um, basically on the edge of the Great Barrier Reef and also um, the Daintree Rainforest, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Rainforest. And, and and I think older than the, um, the Amazon. So it's got really interesting biosphere and um, one of the most bi um, biologically diverse places on the planet. Um, and they say it's where the rainforest meets the reef because you've got parts of the um, Daintree rainforest that come down and, and then you've got the Great Barrier Reef there as well. So you can see um, it's, it's sort of as no far north almost as Darwin. It's kind of in that monsoonal re region, although it's, it's much more set up for tourism all throughout the year. So if you were wanting to come to Australia at Christmas time, for example, you could still go to this area and there'd be places to stay and places open. It would be pretty wet and it would be pretty hot. Um, it's not ideal time to come, but it's certainly still possible for you to um, come here. Um, so this is another luxury lodge um, that's up in this region. So it's in the Daintree called Silky Oaks. Um, it was taken over by a new owner um, just before COVID hit, maybe six months prior. Um, so they're just redoing it all. I stayed there a couple of years ago and I thought it was amazing. It's going to be even more amazing after these renovations. So this will be open in time for next year. You've got um, about 40 different um, 
uh, uh, retreats, they call them. Um, some are high up on stilts, and so you're sort of like in a treehouse style. Some are much more accessible just down a path, and they, they, um, they might have a different view. So depending on your um, ability to walk or what sort of view you like, um, you know, we'd choose the right, um, right retreat room for you. Um, but you can see it's on this beautiful kind of piece of waterway here. Um, so you can go for a swim in there, you can kayak, I think I've got some pictures. Um, they've got lots of self-guided walks, um, helicopter trips to go and have a picnic. Um, you could even go out to the reef from Silky Oak. So it's inland a little bit, but only like 20 minutes, 30 minutes to drive down and then you could um, go out to the reef that way. So you could just spend your whole time at Silky Oaks and, and do your um, Great Barrier Reef experience as well while you're staying there. Um, this is very close uh, to where Silky Oaks is. Um, it's an experience that I think is great for all ages. So um, maybe children from the age of five up. Um, it's called River Drift Snorkeling. Um, this is me on the on the right here. So they um, they basically put you in a, a wetsuit. It's pretty cold. It's too cold for crocodiles, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, and you get your snorkel and your mask. Um, and then, yeah, it's a different type of um, snorkeling experience. So you see kind of brown coloured fish and, and um, turtles and you, you kind of swim under logs that have fallen over trees. Um, so you spend about an hour doing that. And then afterwards they have these kind of floating devices and you just, you literally just float and um, look up <laughs> the trees and it's really relaxing and yeah, really nice little experience um, up there. Um, we've also Indigenous experiences around here as well. Um, so you'll see a different side of the Indigenous culture up here. Um, this is a, a, a guide that uh, we really love. His name's Juan Walker. Um, so he's local from up in that region. He'll take you out and he'll show you how to spear a, a mud crab. Um, you'll go looking for bush foods and find some unusual things that you didn't think you could eat. Um, and he'll talk to you about his culture from his perspective. Um, so he's, he's a great guide. Um, and then you've also got conservation experiences. Um, this, uh, this funny looking bird here, it's, that's almost the size, it's, we've got an emu and then we've, there's the ostrich. So it's sort of not quite as big as an ostrich, it's on the way up there. Um, very prehistoric, it's called a cassowary, they're endangered. Um, but they uh, typically they would live in that Daintree rainforest um, area. Um, if you see them, you, you kind of want to stay away because they've got a big, big claw that they'll, um, <laughs> they, they could attack you with. Um, but yeah, really incredible looking bird to, to see in the wild. And then you've got these little uh, creatures here. So these are called uh, northern quolls, northern spotted quolls, and they're also endangered. Most Australians have probably never even heard of these cute little mammals. They used to be everywhere all over Australia, but because of European settlement, they're very endangered now. But they, um, they're actually meat eating, so they're quite unique. Um, most of our other animals um, that are marsupials, they'll just eat grass, but these ones um, like a bit of meat as well. So we can um, send you out with a researcher or a conservationist, um, typically probably starting in the afternoon, maybe about two o'clock, and so, uh, most of our animals are nocturnal, so you'll get to see some beautiful sights and then as it starts getting dark, then that's when you can start seeing all the animals come out. So, um, yeah, if you're, if you're into wildlife, it's, it's pretty special up there. Um, another kind of conservation angle, if you're interested in this, um, this guy here, his name's Alan Carl, and he's a pretty amazing guy. He, he basically has been... Um, traveling the world, collecting seeds and tropical plants that have you know, grown in um, rainforests all around the world and been useful for, useful for indigenous cultures for, for you know, millennia. And he's, he's now created his own, he calls it the botanical ark. So it's basically an, an orchard of um, trying to save all these amazing tropical plants for, from all around the world. So, um, if you're interested in, in fruits and conservation, um, we can either, you know, you can go and meet him and see, see the work that he's been doing. Um, there's also a four bedroom house that you could stay in if, if you would prefer that kind of accommodation as well. Um, but a really, really interesting man. He's hosted, you know, 
lots of um, dignitaries and, and people, global leaders from around the world um, at his place and yeah, showcasing the amazing work that he does. Um, now we're going to head over to the Great Barrier Reef. So if you come out to Australia, I will always insist that you have to fly over the Great Barrier Reef, whether you're in a helicopter or a fixed wing or a um, seaplane, seeing it from above. And you can see from this picture here, just you see all the colours and the patterns and then you see when it gets really dark, when um, the reef disappears and it drops off. So um, always put that on your itinerary if you are coming here. And so the place we're going to today is Lizard Island. Um, to get to Lizard Island, you typically uh, take a, a normal fixed wing plane. It's one of the northernmost um, Great Barrier Reef Islands in Australia. And it's, it's quite a, um, a dry island as opposed to a tropical kind of feeling island, which you might think doesn't feel that attractive, but when you, when you land, um, and you get out of the plane, you just have this sense of, oh, and you're just instantly re relaxed and, and calmed. Um, so they've got 24 white sand beaches. There's about 40 um, villas dotted around. Again, they, you know, depending on accessibility needs, you've got some that are a bit further away and they might be overlooking one beach. Some are a bit closer to the lodge, making it easier um, to get to if you have walking difficulties. They're all beautiful. Um, it's all fully inclusive, um, really great dining and food there um, and lots of activities. So you can go out snorkeling and, and scuba diving. Um, they've got these little uh, dinghies here, motorized dinghies. So you can take them out yourself. And if you go there, I highly recommend it because it's really fun. Um, so they'll pack you up a picnic. You just tell them what you want, what you want to drink, what you want to eat. Um, it'll all be waiting for you. You hop on the dinghy. They teach you how to drive it. It takes about five, 10 minutes. And then you can just go around to any of those um, 24 beaches and you can spend the day there and just relax and enjoy it. And it's really fun. Um, they've got beaches there where um, turtles are known. So, you know, if you want to go and snorkel with the turtles, you go around to Turtle Beach. If you want more privacy, you'd go a little bit further away. Um, when I went there, the visibility in the water was some of the best that I've ever experienced in any of my snorkeling or scuba diving around the world. Um, you could just see for miles. They have um, big, big giant clams, um, lots of colourful, uh, colourful uh, coral. Um, there was some uh, coral damage, sun bleaching um, and whatnot, you know, and that's happened on a lot of the reef, um, but it's all starting to recover. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> I can't, can't wait to get back there. Um, if you're again, conservation um, minded um, and you've got a really big budget, um, this man here, he, his name's Andy Ridley. He started up an organization called Citizens of the Great Barrier Reef. And um, so he's all about looking at research and, and how to, I guess, improve the conditions of the reef. The reef. So we can um, get you out with him and some researchers. We can hire a super, super yacht or another kind of um, vessel for you. And you can spend four days out with um, people and, what, and watching what they're actually doing and how they're um, trying to preserve the reef. And depending on you know, whether you're into whales or turtles or I don't know, some other manta ray or some sharks, um, we can tailor that around um, your wildlife passions. He actually started up um, Earth Hour. I'm not sure if you've heard of Earth Hour where you would turn the, turn the lights off for an hour once a year, um, but he's, he's right into his um, conservation. So that's Great Barrier Reef. I haven't got too much longer. Um, just wanted to show you a couple of other things. So um, Cairns is kind of the hub where um, you go to the Daintree Rainforest and, um, and to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, there's some new, uh, new product, new, new experiences um, inland that have popped up in the last couple of years. So I just wanted to show you those. Um, this is Mount Mulligan. It's um, one of our newest luxury lodges of Australia. So they've got eight villas and it's family friendly, which is... Um, often a bit of an issue with some of our luxury lodges because they're not family friendly. Um, so you can see this beautiful kind of outback scenery. Um, it's, um, 
a cattle station. It was a, um, a mine. I think it was gold or copper mine. Um, so you can learn about the history um, of, of the place. You can go out and see the farm working or you could just relax. Um, every villa gets um, a little quad bike so you can hop around yourself and go and do what you want. And it's only a 30 minute helicopter ride from Cairns or about a two and a half hour self drive. So if you're coming over and you're wanting an outback experience and a reef experience and a rainforest experience, and you don't want to travel very far, this is a really good option for this, for this area. And particularly um, after COVID and, you know, if you're time poor, if you've only got a week, you could still kind of have a pretty good um, experience in Australia without, um, without spending too much time traveling. So this is um, a couple of the pictures there. So you can see it's, it's nice and relaxing, very beautiful, all inclusive. Um, so yeah, really nice option, particularly for families. And then this is another new one. I haven't um, personally tested this out yet. Um, it's called Kinrara Expeditions and it's, a, it's basically a five day trip um, out from Cairns. And you, um, this area is an extinct volcano and it's kind of like an oasis in the middle of the outback. So it's attracting all this wildlife. You've got all this water here. Um, and basically um, when, you, when you arrive, they're, they'll talk to you and ask you what you're interested in and then they'll tailor your five days based on what you want to do. If, you, if all you want to do is relax, then they'll set that up. If you want to go looking for wildlife, they'll, you know, they'll find ways to make sure that you really see um, some really cool wildlife. If you wanted to go canoeing or kayaking, have some adventure, they'll sort that out for you. So it's um, another really good option. It's also family friendly. And I don't have another slide on there, but yeah, really nice, uh, nice option for you. And then lucky last, uh, two new experiences down on the Great Barrier Reef, but a little bit further south in an area that we call the Whitsunday Islands. Um, you may have um, seen pictures of our white sand beaches. Um, it probably was um, Whitehaven Beach, which is in this area. You can just see what the colour of the water is here. So, um, this is um, a new experience called Heart Island Reef Experience. They've created this luxury pontoon in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and you would basically helicopter there, um, land there, and then you spend a couple of hours. They've got a, um, they've got a boat that's kind of hidden under here that, that comes out and they'll take you around. You can snorkel. This, this here is called Heart Island. Um, it's just a very iconic, um, part of the reef. Um, so you can go and spend, spend some time there and then you can take a scenic flight back and you'll see um, some of the islands and some of the icons um, of that area as well. And then lastly, we have um, the reef suites. So there's only two of them, but it mean you can, you can sort of sleep underwater um, and yeah, see what the, the fish get up to at night time. I'm not sure what they get up to. Um, and so you, you would um, take, a, take a boat out, um, I think about 4.30 in the afternoon, you'd um, have, have a meal, you could do some snorkeling on the reef. Um, and then as you go to bed, you'd, um, you'd have a view like this. Um, and uh, yeah, you spend the night there un underwater. And that's, uh, that's me, I think. So thank you. I hope um, you found that enjoyable and learned something and happy to take some questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Nicola. It was very interesting. And um, well, this presentation gives me goosebumps. It looks so nice, <laughs> all these beautiful pictures and beautiful places to go. And I've learned a lot too, because I saw some new products, which are very interesting to have a look at. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I was looking, uh, checking the questions and uh, um, uh, there's one important question that I, I see. It's about, um, yeah, it's difficult to answer, I think, but uh, when do you expect that uh, the um, Australian borders will <laughs> open again? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's a hard one. Yeah. We, I think realistically, don't quote me, um, probably, Probably around about March, April. So just in time for this itinerary. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which is which was one of the reasons I wanted to show you this one because I think realistically it's 
it's it's doable to to book and and know yeah. that you'll be able to. Um, at the moment, um, you know, most of the flights have stopped to Australia, so you know, it's it's how long does it take them to sort of start everything up again? And yeah, but yeah, it's hard. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. soon. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I can't give a, a better answer, but I I would say not until next year. Yeah, no, it's uh, difficult to, to answer this question. I I can imagine that. Yeah, it's, we will see, but I hope it will open soon because it's such a beautiful yeah. country to go to and it's so safe. It's uh, yeah. less people yeah. living there, especially for the the northern part. Uh, you told us about Bamroo Plains. It's a beautiful place to go. It's one of my favorites too. Yeah, have you been? Have you? Yeah, it's yeah. really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like Africa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's one more question. Um, it's um, about AS Rock. Uh, can yeah. you walk on uh, on the rock? Not anymore. No. So, um, it, it, well, we call it Uluru now because um, a lot of the indigenous people want their names, their old names back. Um, yeah, it, but Ayers Rock. So um, you were able to walk on it until uh, I think it was October last year. They finally shut it. Yeah. Um, I, I walked on it when I was 14. Um, Me too. I yeah. I didn't, I didn't know it was a bad thing to do. Um, but what, were you, what was happening is you would get so many tourists walking up on it. Um, it is actually quite a difficult climb. They had a, you had to use a chain to get up there. There's no toilets up there, um, you know, so it wasn't, it was just getting a bit yucky and over-touristed anyway. Um, but aside from that fact, um, it's, it's sacred to the Indigenous people and it's, it's kind of their church. Yeah. So you wouldn't go walking all over someone else's church. Um, and and from, a, from your perspective, it's much more beautiful now to take photos of because there's no tourists there. You know, they're not up on top ruining running the, the photos um, and you can when you do a walk around it with an indigenous guide who really interprets what it all means to them it just it makes it very very special um, I went out with an indigenous guide here on on Wednesday to um, essentially what is the Ayers Rock of New South Wales so it's as sacred um, to the people from this region as Uluru is as sacred for the people of the central desert and the guide that I had, so normally <laughs> if you sort of go do a tour, if you just take yourself off and, and look at some Indigenous art, you can't interpret it. <laughs> so when you've yeah. got a good guide who really understands what it all means, it just, it just changes everything. So, yeah, um, yeah I would say it, I think it's a good thing that, um, yeah, that they've closed it. To, yeah, to walk. yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful place to go and to, to walk around to and, and stay in longitude and have this view yeah. on the rock. Yeah. It's amazing, yeah. And you yeah. can take a helicopter up anyway and have a look that yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, the, the, uh, the questions, uh, yeah, we're finished with the questions. And um, okay. if other people have more questions, um, you're welcome to ask uh, okay. me. Just send me an email or uh, give me a call. And um, yeah, now we are finishing our webinar uh, about Australia. And I would like to thank you very much for your, for your great presentation. It was very interesting. Yeah, I look really appreciate to, it. If you all come down, just let me know and I'll, um, I'll come and host you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hope soon. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thanks very course. much. And uh, yeah, right. we can, can um, okay. I'm gonna push the button sharing. to stop broadcasting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.